Now, over the last, these next two weeks, we are wrapping up our series on Philippians. If you've been keeping track, we're in week 16 of our sermon series on Philippians. We'll go to week 18, uh, but uh, we are, we've been in this process. And if, you, if you've been following, you know that almost every week I say to you, the context is important. The context matters. What Paul was dealing with in his personal life, uh, we need to understand that because it's reflected in his writing. Now, he was not sitting down as he wrote this letter, sitting down on a mountaintop, watching the sun come up, smelling bacon, cooking on the grill, you know, watching happy little birds chirping on olive branches outside his study. Paul was not in a Bob Ross painting. He was confined, he was restricted, he was chained up, either chained to the guards or chained to the wall, and he was like that for almost two years. He was confined and in prison. His freedom was restricted. He had Roman guards standing over him, telling him when to eat and when to wake up. It was a lot like marriage for Paul. <laughs> Just kidding. Paul was in, really, he was in a miserable place. It wasn't a comfortable place where he was. Paul could have written this letter to his friends complaining about his circumstances. He could have been griping. He could have moaned and groaned about how bad life was. And he could have even summed up his uh, challenging circumstances by saying, be, God must not really love me as much as I thought he did because I've been telling people about Jesus and now I'm in prison for it. And I think maybe you and I have said things like that when we walk through difficult seasons of our lives, whether we said it out loud, whether we said it quietly to God, but we've said something similar. Why is God doing this to me? Or why am I going through this? If God loved me, wouldn't he spare me from this? But instead of complaining and instead of groaning and moaning, Paul wrote these words that we're going to be looking at today. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now, to me personally, outside all of the passages in scripture explaining how to be forgiven for our sins and experience new life in Jesus. To me, this is one of the passages that followers of Jesus ought to cling to and to meditate on and to memorize. If you're a follower of Jesus, meaning that you've surrendered your life to God by trusting in Jesus as the only way to be forgiven for your sins, that you believe by faith that Jesus paid the price for your sins, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that one day he's going to return. If you believe those things and you've committed to following him, then from now or from that time that you surrender your life to him, until you meet Jesus face to face, you are in a process now of becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. And we are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We have been forgiven for our sins, but now we're in a process of becoming more godly, more like Jesus as we live our lives. And the key way that you and I become more and more like Jesus is in our thought life. It's in what we think about. It, it involves our brain. Now, this may surprise you about the person sitting beside you, but they use their brain a lot. Uh, they, they use their brain a lot. In fact, researchers tell us 
that our brains produce roughly 50,000 thoughts every single day. 50,000 thoughts every single day. That's about 35 thoughts every single minute. Raise your hand if it surprises you that the person sitting beside you thinks that much. <laughs> now, those same researchers that did this study also tell us that out of those 50,000 thoughts that we think, 70 to 80% of those thoughts are negative thoughts. They're, they're not good thoughts. That means only about 20 to 30% of the thoughts that we actually think are positive, are good. And that's why, in case you didn't know, that's why gossip and slander are so like, people just run amok when they hear something negative about somebody, they gotta wait to tell something, uh, tell, tell somebody else. Because we think negatively. We just automatically think more negative thoughts than positive thoughts. And it's sad because we know that positive thoughts are better than negative thoughts, right? Positive thoughts are better than negative thoughts. Think about all the negative thoughts that you may have had this past week. If you were to sit back and you were to examine your thought life, comparing them to Philippians 4, 8, things that are true and lovely and anything that has good report, it, what did you think about this past week predominantly? Maybe you thought about your family this week. Or maybe you thought a lot about your spouse this week or your marriage this week. Maybe you thought a lot about your future this past week. Uh, and maybe all of those thoughts weren't necessarily positive thoughts. Maybe when you thought about your spouse, you thought negatively about your spouse. Maybe when you thought about your children, you thought negatively about your children. Maybe when you thought about your neighbor who's still shooting fireworks off, <laughs> you thought negatively about them. And when we think negative thoughts, those about other people, they will weigh us down. We're going to become suspicious of other people if we think negatively about them. We're gonna doubt them. We're gonna doubt who they really are. We're gonna doubt their character because we're caught up in this cycle of thinking negatively about people most of the time. And if these researchers are correct, that means we have about 40,000 negative thoughts every single day that from the course of the weekend, from last weekend's worship to this weekend's worship, that we each have wrestled with roughly 280,000 negative thoughts. That over this last week, from one worship service to the next, we've had 280,000 negative thoughts. Now multiply that by about 300 people in this room today. You multiply that, you get roughly 84 million negative thoughts that you and I brought into this place of worship. That's heavy. It's a lot of negativity in our life. And that's why I love what Paul was saying to them. Paul was in prison. If he, should, if he could have been negative, that's the time to be negative. And instead, he wrote to the Philippian church and said, finally, think about the things that are true and honorable and commendable and right and pure and lovely. You know, when we think negatively about people, it shows. When you think negatively about your spouse, if you always think in your mind, my spouse can't do anything right, your spouse is never gonna do anything right in your mind. If you think that your children are just miscreants and crazy, then they're always going to be miscreants and crazy to you. What we think about people impacts how we interact with them. If you think somebody is not trustworthy, if you doubt them, then you're not going to want to take advice from them. But we can think positively but we can think 
positively. We can have positive thoughts surrounding our mind. We don't have to settle for 70 to 80% of our thoughts being negative. We can be mind controlled, we can have self control, and we can tell our brain what to think about. Thinking positively can make such a great difference in our lives and how you interact with people. And I think that that's why Paul challenged these early followers of Jesus to think about positive things. Think about what he said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Paul's message to the Philippian believers is very, very simple. You can control your thought life. You can control what you think about. You can. I can. See, and if you really desire to change your life, you may have come in here today at the end of your rope. You may have come in here today feeling hopeless and saying, well, I wonder what God wants to say to me or I wonder if God even cares. I want you to know something. Your thought life can change. You can change the way you view yourself when you look in the mirror. You can change the way you view the church and you can change the way you view God if you begin to focus on what Paul tells us to think about. See, it's impossible for us to experience life change if we're not willing to change our thought life. We have to change our thought life if we're going to experience real life change. Think about it. If you want a better relationship with your spouse, you gotta start thinking about having a better relationship with your spouse. If you wanna break bad habits, you've got to begin to break those bad habits in your mind. If you want to change the way you speak to your children, it's got to begin in your minds. See, our thought life is the foundation for every action that we do. Our thought life is the foundation for everything that we do and say. You came to church this weekend as a direct result of your thoughts. Somewhere along the line, you said, I'm going to go to church this weekend. You made a decision, you thought about going, you weighed whether or not you were really gonna go or maybe I'd like to go out on the boat or maybe I'll go to church, I'm gonna go to church. And so you made that decision based on the thought. And if you want to overcome addictions, if you want to overcome loneliness, if you want to overcome anxiety, fear, criticism, self-doubts, negativity, if you want to overcome and have better communication and have better relationships, it begins with your thought life first. Now, granted, a caveat to this is if you have a medical diagno diagnosis, uh, you've been clinically diagnosed with depression or anxiety and you are taking meds, please continue to take your meds. That's important. That matters. That's significant. But if you are wrestling in these other areas, begin to ask God to change your thought life. See, and, and people will often try to defend the negative thoughts that they think or the negative criticisms that they share, and they do it like this. They say something like, well, I'm just trying to be honest. And then they share a bunch of, you know, four paragraphs about negativity about somebody else. But there's an enormous problem with seeing things from our perspective and from our own understanding. We're told in Proverbs to trust in the Lord with all our heart and do not lean on our own understanding. Our own understanding can be wrong. What we believe to be true about somebody can be wrong. Your thoughts can be wrong. My thoughts can be wrong. Our assumptions can be wrong. I had a bad thought this past week that I'm gonna confess and share with you. Thursday, I just heard somebody moan. Thursday was my day off and I used my brain and I thought, 
I need to change the oil in my car. So I took my car up to the place where I always take it. And the guy behind the counter said, I'd never brought my car there before. And I was starting to get a little mad. And I said, I've been here many times with my car. And he said, you've never been here with this car. And I don't know why he made it a big deal. And I don't know why I made it a big deal. But I got huffy and in my thoughts, I said, I'll just go home and change my oil myself. That was country talk for, I will go home and change my oil myself. And he said, good luck. (laughs) Now, growing up in Tennessee, I changed my oil quite often. But roughly 25 years ago, the first time I pulled my car into an instant oil change place, and they called me sir, and they changed all, uh, they checked all my fluids and topped off everything, and they changed my oil, and I was done in 15 minutes. I was like, I am never going to change my oil again. But Thursday, I relapsed. And so I went to O'Reilly and I picked up five quarts of oil and a funnel and an oil filter wrench. And I said, I know what I'm doing. And I pulled my car into my garage, which was 150 degrees. (laughs) And I put the beetle up on jack stands to get about this much clearance so I could get underneath there. And as I crawled underneath, all of a sudden my thoughts began, well, you had a friend that died when he was changing his oil. Like literally the jack stands kicked out from underneath him, collapsed and his wife found him. Is this how you want your wife and children to find you? (laughs) So I scooted back out. I went and I checked the jack stands on both sides of the car and said, okay, I got this, I can do this. And I shook the car just to make sure, okay, it's not falling. Crying back underneath and looking, where's the oil filter? Where's the oil plug? Okay, found them, started the process. Oil was everywhere, all over my body, all over the garage floor. (laughs) Took some time cleaning it up. But while I was changing the oil, my wife came out and shared her thoughts with me. (laughs) She said, you know, that's the way Kenny died. (laughs) So I thanked her for her encouragement, finished changing the oil, and now three days later, four days later, my body is sore. My legs are sore, my backside is sore, my arms are sore, and my pride is hurt because now I have an oil drip on my oil filter. I don't even know where I'm at. One, one prideful, stubborn thought that guy's wrong. And all of a sudden I want to prove that I can do it. He doesn't even know me. He doesn't care if I completed the oil change. When he said, good luck, he meant it. (laughs) He wished me well. And now I'm going to have to drive the car back up there and said, will you tighten my oil filter? (laughs) Or it's the oil plug. I don't know what it is. So I had a bad thought and that bad thought led to a poor decision. God does not want his followers to depend on our own understanding. We're limited in our understanding. When we live out our lives in our own understanding, it sure makes life a lot more difficult. We don't see the big picture like God sees the big picture. Our assumptions, our suspicions, our conclusions are often wrong. But... When we gain control of our thoughts and we begin to think more God-like thoughts, we will find that godly thinking leads to godly living in God's presence. Godly thinking leads to godly living and to God's presence. After Paul told these believers to think about these things, he then made a pretty bold statement to them. He said that these believers had seen Paul living out these godly thoughts. He went on to say in verse nine, focus on what is true, think about what's true, lovely, right? Then he said, what you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. 
Now Paul wasn't think, talking and pointing about heavenly thoughts. Now Paul was pointing at his own life. Paul was pointing to the Philippian believers at the way they lived or the way he lived. And he was saying, if you want to know what will happen to you, if you begin to have godly thoughts and control your thought life, you will wind up like me. The things that you've seen in me, the things that you've heard from me, the way that you've seen me live my life, if you think about those things, you're gonna wind up like me. Godly thinking leads to godly living. And that's why it's so important for followers of Jesus to read our Bibles and to call out to God and to sit down in his presence. And I want to encourage you, if you've not yet signed up for the new Grow class that's gonna happen on August 22nd as part of our Next Steps launch, Sign up for that. You can sign up for it on our website. It's gonna help you understand how to grow in your personal relationship with God through establishing a daily quiet time. See, the more time we spend with Jesus in his presence, the more we become like him, and the more we come, become like him, the more God gets control of our thought life. So finally, what do we do with those negative thoughts when they creep in? They're gonna pop up. They're gonna come in. What do we do? First, when you get those negative thoughts as you're trying to control your thought life and you realize you're thinking negatively, I want you to capture that thought. I want you to grab a hold of it with your, with your spiritual mind. I want you to grab hold of it with the, the eyes of your heart and say, why am I thinking this thought? When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, he addressed thoughts that people had that were actually preventing other people from giving their lives to Jesus. He said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to know Christ. Now, Paul was speaking about the rebellious thoughts of other people. Those rebellious thoughts were keeping people from a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was capturing their thoughts as he would argue and reason with them. And he would teach them how to obey Christ. But you and I can capture our personal rebellious thoughts. The next time you get a negative thought, about somebody, a friend, a family member, a church member, a, a, a child, a neighbor. The next time you get a negative thought, capture it, pluck it out. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you why you are thinking those thoughts and then invite God's power to work in your life. Invite God to open up your heart and give you wisdom and understanding. 2 Peter 1.3 says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. So depend upon God's power to cleanse your thought life. See, God wants to build a godly future through you. God wants to do something amazing in your life that he has not done in anyone else's life. He wants to use you to bring life change to other people around you. And he can do it if you commit your thoughts to him, focus your mind on him, put his kingdom first and live joyfully and experience his presence on a regular basis. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've given us this passage to think about, to meditate on, to talk about. Thank you that you allow our minds to be controlled by your spirit. And Lord, it's our prayer that you would help us to become the men and women that you've created us to be by using this passage of scripture in our lives to think about what is true and right and honorable and good and not spend so much of our time thinking negatively. Father of all people on the planet, we followers of Jesus ought to have the most positive thoughts. And so Lord, we pray that you would help us to think positively, not negatively, to have godly thoughts because you are what is true and honorable and commendable. 
Help us to become the people of God you've created us to be in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.